I like this class. It's uh, definitely one of my favorite ones, uh, both to learn and to teach. Uh, there's a lot of kind of uh, really interesting stuff that goes on in this class. We're going to talk about two of the primary laws that govern our existence, the law of return and recurrence and the law of evolution and involution. A great quote to start as well. Inside the intellectual animal, there exist tremendous possibilities that can be developed or lost. It is not a law that these possibilities develop themselves. Evolutive mechanics cannot develop them. Because remember, in, we carry inside us the seed of something much greater, right? We carry inside us the seed of the divine. There's something that we can do that, uh, through that mechanism allows us to transform ourselves. But it's important to remember that that's an active process. And this ties into what I talked about during the first class. Change is not a passive process. It's not sitting around waiting for something to happen. It's actively going out there and pursuing that change, living that change. And that's what I mean here, that there's no law that says sitting around and doing nothing, suddenly you're going to awaken consciousness. This is something that must be pursued in the same way that, you know, sitting around doing nothing isn't going to turn you into a great pianist. You're going to have to go out and do something and learn to play the instrument practice and all that kind of stuff. This is the same thing. The idea being that the human race in general, it might be evolving, so to speak, in a physiological sense, in what our bodies are doing, but as far as a spiritual or uh, talking about the level of the consciousness, there's nothing that's happening to evolve that. If anything, it's going the other way. It's going through the process of involution or degeneration. That's what's happening at a spiritual level. And of course, we know the intellectual animal is really the unawakened human being. A human being that hasn't reached their true potential. The idea being that we haven't awakened that spark of the divine within us, so there's not really much that separates us from the rest of the animals wandering on the planet. The only real difference between us is we have the intellect, where animals just act on instinct. <clears throat> so let's have a look at the law of return. The law of return simply states we come back to the physical world to be born again in a physical body. Okay, the idea being that this is not your first time round on this planet. This is not your first trip on this planet, so to speak. When you die, you come back. That's really what the law of return is talking about. That's okay. The law of return, then, is the return to the womb. It's reincorporating into a new human organism. That's actually what's happening. The idea that when we die, we come back. Death is really just the beginning, death being the beginning of the new life, and the return is the return to the womb, reincorporating into a new human organism, staying once again in this physical plane, in the, the realm of the, the physical world. <clears throat> what is it that actually returns? This is an interesting question, because you remember that uh, going back to the second class, the human being is composed of three things. What were the three things? Give me one. The personality. Give me another one. Essence. Give me the third one. Ego. There you go. Okay, ego, essence, personality. Those are the three things that we that we have sitting in this chair right now. The question is, what is it then that returns of those? Well, what we can know is the essence and the ego is, is what returns. Remember, the personality was a product of time. The personality was like the armor, the shell that was built up in response to the circumstances that happened, primarily during the first seven years of our childhood. Okay, so the personality is beyond, uh, belongs to time, the physical body beyond, belongs to time, obviously when we die they disintegrate, but it's the ego and the essence that continues, and if you remember, one of the neat things about that is both the essence and the egos, they exist outside of time, right? They don't belong to the third or the fourth dimension, so they exist outside of time. It's the physical body that's bound to time, it's the personality that's bound to time. So the physical body has a beginning and an end on a timeline, just like the personality does. The essence and the egos, they don't belong to time, so they don't have a start and end the same way that the physical body does. Sorry, so that ego is the one that you've always had throughout all of Yes, time? and remember egos, we're talking plural here. We're talking legion, right? right. Hundreds of egos. But yeah, same, absolutely. Same ones or changing ones? Same ones. Yeah, the same ones that you've just been feeding from existence to existence, causing them to grow and grow and grow and grow and grow. You've been carrying with them, carrying them with you, lifetime to lifetime to lifetime. Uh, which is why when people talk about past lives, sometimes it can be useful to actually learn about and study your past lives, because you can find the cause of a lot of your errors in a previous past life. And what you're going to see today is it can be really handy to know what's happening with our past lives, because that's going to predict what's happening with this life as well, which is really interesting. Um, some people think of this as reincarnation. There's a small distinction. Reincarnation is a return by choice. 
So awakened beings, masters, can reincarnate. They can choose where and when they come back and the circumstances in which they come back. Return is what happens to regular people like us. We don't really have a say in choosing to come back to this world. When we lose this physical body, we're incorporated into another physical body. A master is someone, you know, someone like Jesus or Buddha or something like that, that can incarnate. A higher being that can say, I'm taking this form at this time for this purpose in this location. That's what reincarnation really is. We don't have that kind of choice. We just simply return. <clears throat> After death, as I mentioned, the physical body and personality deteriorate. So you don't carry the same physical body from lifetime to lifetime. You don't look the same. Which, if you've ever had a dream um, before about a friend or a significant other, and in the dream you knew it was them, but it didn't look like them, that's why you're just remembering what they looked like from a previous existence, which isn't the same as what they look like now. And the personality it reforms um, in response to the new environment with each lifetime. The egos, they're the ones that are dragging us back. The egos want us back here. That's the problem. The egos are like the anchor, they're like the chain that keeps us bound to this physical world. And that has some huge implications that we're going to look at today. Uh, the egos bring us back again and again and again to satisfy the desires, the wants that we have, right? Because it's through those desires, it's through those wants, it's through those emotions and those actions and those thoughts that we're feeding and sustaining the ego. So the ego is bringing us back again and again, keeping us chained here, so we're caught in this circle which is constantly feeding the ego. That's why we're here. That was never the design. The design was, you know, we started at the bottom and we were supposed to ascend, keep climbing all the levels of creation until we united back with the source. That was the original plan, so to speak. That's the meaning of life. That's why we're here. But somewhere along the way, we got lost, we got distracted, and we got stuck here because of the ego. So we come back again and again and again to satisfy desire. And this is a little bit of a prelude to next week's class to also pay karma to account for our actions, both good and bad as well. <clears throat> Why is it that we return? We keep returning for the purpose of becoming perfect, the purpose of correcting our errors. Karma and its various punishments teaches us lessons. We're put here to, given, to be given the opportunity to grow and develop that spiritual side of us. We're like the seed that's planted in the dirt, right? The dirt's where it's gross and disgusting. The idea that eventually that seed will germinate, grow, and grow up to the heavens again. We're stuck in the dirt. We haven't quite germinated that seed. That's why we come back again and again and again. Because until that seed grows, we're stuck here. These different uh, lifetimes that we have allow us the opportunity to perfect ourselves, allow us the opportunity to develop that divine within us to awaken that essence, to awaken that consciousness. That's why we keep coming back. We keep coming back in the same situations over and over again to be given the opportunity to make a better choice, to be given the opportunity to not identify with the ego and instead to identify with the essence. And of course, each time we make a wrong choice in life, karma is there as a universal force to correct our actions, to teach us that that was not the right way to act, that that's not the right way to live, that's not the right way to treat somebody as an example. But we don't get the message. <laughs> you know, we're like that kid that goes to, doesn't look both ways across the street, so the parents give him a smack. It's, you know, something that's to correct the kid to say, this is for your own good, you're supposed to look, or else something bad can happen to you. We just keep running out of the traffic again and again and again and again and again, lifetime after lifetime after lifetime. We just don't get the hint. We just don't get the message. So consequently, we find ourselves bound to the physical world. We found our, find ourselves trapped down here. If we don't work on ourselves, if we don't attempt to develop spiritually, the ego grows too powerful. We find ourselves in a situation where instead of that essence growing and developing, it's the ego instead that grows and develops. Remember the story I told you of the ancient, the, the aboriginal story about the two wolves fighting inside us, the white wolf and the black wolf, and which one's going to win? It's the one that we feed, right? Unfortunately for us, that's who we feed. Okay, we've misidentified, we've, we've made the mistake of identifying with the ego instead of the essence, so all the attention, all the direction is directed towards the ego. So that's what's growing inside of us, the false self, so to speak. You know, we develop our, we don't develop our, our true potential because we're too focused on the distraction, we're too focused on the ego. So what happens over time is the ego grows stronger and stronger and stronger at the expense of the essence. And that's what happens when we don't work on ourselves, when we don't attempt to develop spiritually, when we don't try to awaken consciousness. 
So what we see from lifetime to lifetime is the ego complicates itself. Okay, we become more and more corrupt, so to speak. We become more and more ego and less and less consciousness. Okay, that use the term perverse here, but I just mean it in the sense of comparing it to a, a true spiritual individual. We find ourselves, average humanity, in a state of degeneration, if you look at it that way, from a perfect humanity. Okay, comparing ourselves to an awakened master like Jesus or Buddha, we're at a quite lower level, a you know, perverse, degenerated kind of level from where the, ideally we should be. So over time what happens is, and this quotes back to the quote that we started the class with, the idea that evolutive mechanics doesn't develop us spiritually. The exact opposite happens. Because of the ego from existence to existence, that's what we feed. That's what we keep directing our attention to. So over time, the ego grows and becomes more complicated, not the essence. And that's a problem. We're going to look at how we can break that pattern. <clears throat> now, this is an interesting concept. We return only so many times. We have 108 lifetimes. And there's some significance to this number, which we'll talk about much later. Uh, 108 adds up to 9, which is a, a, a bit of numerology there that we'll explain at a, a much later date. Um, essences who conclude their 108 lives without eliminating the egos, without incarnating the higher self, the soul, they enter the infernal regions, which is where the concept of hell comes from. So we'll be talking more about that today as well. Um, if you've ever seen a statue of Buddha, this guy up here, uh, they usually have a necklace with 108 beads on it. That's where the 108 lives come from. And oftentimes that necklace looks kind of it's a bit <coughs> scary because it's 108 skulls, each of the skulls representing a human lifetime. Okay? So the idea being we were that seed planted in the ground, and we're, each lifetime is an opportunity for that seed to grow. When we use a life and that seed doesn't grow, then it's re sown in the ground again, giving it another opportunity to grow. And that only happens 108 times. Yes? Actually, how do we know it's 108? How do we know it's 108? Yes. Well, the, um, going back to that number I mentioned earlier, it's kind of, I don't want to go there fully, but there's yes, some okay. Kabbalistic significance behind the number 9, right? And where I'm, this comes from, that Why comes from. Why one? Let's get up to 9. Because this comes from Buddhism, the concept of 108. I don't want to get too much into okay. numerology right now, because it's like, right. you want to say what you can't say without jumping into all the stuff. But, so trust me on 108 for right now. Okay. okay, that one will be revealed at a later date. See, that means you want to come back, right? Because it's like a cliffhanger. So you've got your 108 lives without eliminating, sorry, essences who conclude their 108 lives without eliminating the egos, without incarnating the soul, they basically enter into hell, for lack of a better term. And we'll expand more on that concept actually later today. Okay, so the seed's planted in the ground, if it doesn't grow, it's re-sown a total of 108 times. Nothing happens after 108 times, the seed is literally thrown away. It's basically too late for the plant to grow. And we'll explain why that happens today as well. It's a big class, all kinds of stuff. <coughs> Except <coughs> numerology. So that's different than the Christian idea of it. At the end of each life, you either go to heaven or hell. Yes. Uh, yeah, that's... Different. And also the idea that you're saying... Uh, incar without incarnating the soul. Okay, I'm a little confused because I thought we in we incarnate 108 times. No, th okay, uh, just to back up, because that's actually a good point. Um, Christianity is unusual amongst the world's various spiritual schools in that Christianity was unique by saying, hey, you already have your soul. You just do what I tell you and you get to keep it. Most of the other worlds, the soul or world's religions, the soul was something that had to be earned. It was something that you had to get. It was something that you had to grow and develop in yourself. That's the process of incarnating in the soul. Okay. We have the potential, which is the essence, the seed, but if we don't develop and let that seed grow, then it can't literally turn into the soul. So we have the building box for the oh, soul, okay. but we haven't fully incarnated it yet. We haven't fully developed it within us where Christianity said, hey, everyone's got it, just do this, do this, don't do that, give us this money, and you get to keep it. So, so the soul, I'm sorry, I apologize, That's okay. but the soul is what we're, go, we're, we're actually looking for. Yes. It's, like, it's like a piece of God. Yeah. yeah, we have the ability to develop that within us. So to reach our true potential <laughs> is to develop the soul. Okay? To self-realize is to develop the soul. To awaken consciousness is to develop the soul. Okay, that's what we're trying to do on this path. We're trying to incarnate our true potential. We have the beginning, we have that spark, that tiny piece, we have that seed. If that seed germinates, then we could call the plant the soul. 
Okay, so there's a connection there. It's not that we don't have any, it's we have the beginning of it. We just have to turn it into something. We have to develop it within us. That process of, develop, of developing it, sorry, we call incarnating, okay, or awakening consciousness. It really all means the same thing. Um, so speaking of this 108 lies, the strange thing about that is where we are right now in humanity, uh, almost all the essences occupying this planet have currently almost reached that level. Okay, so the point we are in humanity, and this ties into some classes we'll talk about later, almost everyone walking around right now is really close to having this counter take over. Which, yeah, which the time it's, is running out. And why I'm telling you this be, is because sometimes when people see 108 lies, they go, oh, I got lots of time then. <laughs> I'll just, you know, take it easy this one, and I'll maybe get it the next time around. Um, that might not be the case. Most people, given the state of this current humanity and given changes that are occurring that are nothing to do with 2012, don't even get me started, oh, um, they're close to turning that over. Okay, we're getting close to reaching that level. Um, so you have to kind of think of it this way, that you know, time's running out, it's not like we have the luxury of perhaps wasting another lifetime. Um, because you'll see today, um, one of the interesting aspects of the law of recurrence is because you're sitting here, you've been sitting here before. Because you're interested in studying spiritual things, you've done this before, and obviously you haven't worked hard enough, you're still here. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> Maybe 107 times. <laughs> so this is the one where you're going to like, I'm really going to give it a go this time. I'm really going to make a go of it this but, time. But I get what you're saying there, but uh, without getting into other stuff, is uh, but certain uh, essences are being manipulated and, and other things are going on that sometimes are involved in this part of the scenario of 108 lives and, you know, resonances, you know. Yeah, like, there's, that's a possibility. There's, like, there's other things besides that, why we're not reaching, reaching that level. Yeah, yeah because there's, there's all kinds of other yeah, there's, And there's likely more than I can think of, but I'm thinking of one. Yeah, there's, there's lots of different influences for okay. sure as to why we might right, nice. self-realize. But what's also interesting here is that if you're saying all essences have almost completed their cycle of existence, why aren't there new essences being... Like if we were created there at one time to be an be. essence... Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Ooh, more foreshadowing, right? Stay tuned. Come back next time. <laughs> it's frustrating, isn't it? Because you have all these questions and I want to tell you everything. But well, to we want to know. We so want to know everything. But yeah, there's, there's all kinds of... And that's the, the great part of some of these classes, and especially some of these early Phase A classes. It is just spawned with so many questions and so many things to think about and so many things to reflect about it and has all these implications. Yeah, it's pretty exciting. Um, okay, so return was we die, we come back again. Most people think of that as reincarnation. Slight differences. Reincarnation is for the awakened masters. The poor staffs like us. We get returned. Okay, why do we get returned? Because we never develop what we're supposed to develop. We stay stuck in this physical existence. We stay stuck in time because of the ego. Okay? The idea of 108 lives is basically telling us that process isn't indefinite. It only happens for so long before another process kicks in. And that process is the idea of basically the infernal regions help. And we'll talk about that later today as well. Okay? So we die, we come back, but only so many times. Okay? The idea being too that you have a bunch of times to do that, but probably not anymore. Because you're getting really close to the end, so eh, it's time to think about actually, you know, doing it this time and making a difference. Uh, and that brings us to the law of recurrence. And the law of recurrence is okay. Return as we die, we come back. But when we come back, upon returning to that new physical body, we're subjected to the law of recurrence. Okay, so return, we die, we come back. But when we come back, what we do and what happens in that life is governed by the law of recurrence. And basically what we see as a result of the law of recurrence, each life we repeat everything we did in the previous. It's like Groundhog Day. You're living the same life over and over and over and over again. Put in the same situations, given the same opportunities, and you keep making the same mistakes over and over again. Okay? Ever had deja vu before? Mm -hmm. Now you know why you have deja vu. You ever thought, well, I've totally done this before? It's because you have. Maybe 107 times before, to be specific. <laughs> okay, that's where that comes from. What we see then, life is a vicious cycle of the repetition of dramas, romances, events, and encounters, usually with the same people. Parents and children just ch taking the, changing the role from parent to child and all that kind of stuff. 
the same relationships with the same people. Yes? Is that only means uh, occurs to humans or what about the animals? Mm. Like trees or plants? We'll see that later today as well because that's, that's a totally different scale. That's a totally different scale. We'll see that later today. We're going to look at that different, uh, those different levels because that's all involved in the growth of the essence because it travels through those different paths for sure. Um, so the lifetimes we see as a human, what we end up being in is caught in this cycle of a repetition of everything. Uh, each life though, what we see as far as a change in variation from lifetime to lifetime, each life suffers the consequences of the good and bad that you did in previous, which is the law of karma, right? We've all heard the concept of karma. Um, and don't want to get too much into karma right now because that's going to take class as a whole class of order to karma, but you kind of have to touch on it here because as we live lifetime to lifetime, it's not an exact copy because there's things that are, there's corrections, there's balances and adjustments that are made based on the actions of the previous <coughs> life. Okay, but for the most part, there's a lot of similarities, especially similarities in the, the dramas that we encounter in life, the romances we're involved in, you know, best friends, family, all that stuff we're going to see is there's a strong connection between that from lifetime to lifetime. And, and that seems weird when somebody tells you that, you know what, I'm living the same life over and over again, that sounds totally bizarre, it doesn't even make any sense. But then you look around at everything around you in nature. And repetition is everywhere. We are caught on a machine, a very mechanical machine, and that machine is nature. And repetition surrounds us. Everything repeats. Uh, day and night repeat. The seasons repeat. Movements of the planets repeat. If you studied any esotericism before, you've heard this expression, as above, so below. Mm -hmm. The microcosm is just a reflection or a mirror in the macrocosm. That same idea. So it seems weird that you would live the same life over and over again, but everything around us is caught on this cycle with different levels, okay? And we're part of that cycle, so it's not unusual. Just like the planets revolve around the sun, repeating that pattern over and over again, our life follows the same pattern. We're caught on the same mechanical tracks. So it seems a little unusual to think about, but then you look, about most, you look around at most of the laws of nature in the physical universe, and you see there's a strong element of repetition there. Why would we assume, as physical beings bound to this physical plane, that we're somehow magically exempt from all of that? And we're not, right? Nature is very mechanical, so consequently our lives are governed by the same mechanical laws. Just like the sun rises and sets each day, the same thing happens in our life. You can call it rising, you know, being a, a child and growing up. You can call it setting, growing old and dying. But that thing repeats again and again and again. Um, Death, then, is the return to the very beginning of life to repeat that same cycle again and again. That's what the law of recurrence is. Death happens, there's a return, but then that life happens and there's that process of repetition. And remember, why the process of repetition is there, that seed has to grow. It keeps being planted in the ground. You keep being put in the same situations to be given the opportunity to identify with the essence and feed and grow that. But every time you come back to the same scenario, you keep making the wrong choice and you identify with the ego. So all that energy, all that attention gets fueled toward the false self rather than the true self, rather than the spiritual self. That's why we come back. It's like, oh, you didn't get it? Okay, try again. What are you going to do? Oh, wrong decision. Try again. What are you going to do? Oh, wrong decision. Happens over and over and over again until we make a conscious effort to break that cycle. It doesn't happen automatically. We have to say, I'm stuck. I'm going to make the conscious effort to now identify with the consciousness, to choose the path of the consciousness to break this cycle, to break this repetition. Life repeats itself from existence to existence across innumerable centuries. So and it's not just a case of 107, 108 lifetimes one after each other. So let's say you lived for 100 years and you had 108 lifetimes, so we're talking 10,800 years. It doesn't happen like that either. You can see it a much larger time frame um, because in the space between living and dying, you're existing in a place outside of time. Mm -hmm. So people always say, well, how long until I die and come back? Is it like I die in one second and I'm born a second later? It doesn't quite work like that because the space where you go in between, there is no time there. So it's a totally different thing that happens. <clears throat> That's where we get the concept of the serpent biting its tail, the Ouroboros, right? The end is simply the beginning. 
This is one of my favorite quotes. It's one of those things to, to really reflect on. The past projects itself into the future through the alley of the present. Because really, there's no difference between past, present, and future. They're all the same points occurring on the same line, right? It's just our perspective that allows us to say, this one's behind me, this one's in front of me. When really, it doesn't matter. They're all happening at the same place at the same time. And the ancients knew this. This is three different depictions of the same thing. This is an ancient Chinese symbol. It's a dragon. This is more of um, a Nordic, Northern European symbol. And this, of course, is a Mayan concept. It's the same thing. It's the serpent biting its tail. It's the end is just the beginning. And there's a name given to that figure. It's Uroboros, and that's what it, it represents. And you'll see that described in tons of different cultures. Remember, that's the idea of enosis, right? It's the original wisdom. You just see the same thing replicated in different cultures, in different languages, in different time periods. There's the exact same concept. You've got Chinese, you've got Northern European, and you've got the Mayan, separated by thousands of years, thousands of kilometers, expressing the exact same principle. The principle that's being expressed here is the law of recurrence, the idea that death isn't an end, death is a beginning, the beginning of the same thing, the repetition. Just like night isn't death, night is just a transition into the next day. Okay, winter isn't death, winter is a transition into the next year. It's that same sort of a concept. You see the same thing repeating again and again and again. The past projects itself into the future through the alley of the present. We're just moving around the circle on different points. Where future and past is just depends on where we are relative to that circle. When we undergo the process of recurrence, so when we come back and we have a, a new life, a way to think of it, life is like a movie that we carry along with us after death to project once again on the screen of our new existence. So when we die, it's like stop, rewind, play again. That's what's happening over and over again. Okay? Um, you can think of it just like a movie, the idea that there's a script we carry with us for existence to existence that says these are the events that are going to happen. The egos are the actors in our movie. Okay, so think of ourselves as think of our life like a movie, all these different events. The egos become the actors in our movie. The egos play the same roles to act out the same scenes. Okay, and this is kind of a, an important concept to understand because it shows us the role of the ego in the various existences that we have and reinforces the idea of why it's important to study the ego and to work towards eliminating the ego. Okay, so it's when we die, it's stop, rewind, play, and the whole thing happens once again. The ego's becoming the actors in our movie, playing the same roles in the same scenes. For example, let's use a, a, just a simple, um, sim a simple thing to illustrate this. If in a past existence, let's say at age 25, a man has an affair with a woman. In his new existence, at age 25, the same ego that had been waiting will seek the woman out again. Likewise, the ego and the woman seeks out the man to live out that same scene so those two egos can feed themselves. Whether it's egos of anger, egos of lust, whatever's happening in that situation. So the egos are constantly drawing us back into the same situations. Okay? To live out the same thing again and again. Okay? The egos, in this case, being the actors, the ones that are directing how the scene's going to turn out. Uh, let's look at another simple example. Two enemies who fought to death at a particular age will seek each other out in a new existence at the same time to repeat the tragedy again. Okay, the idea that we're caught in the same tracks, going through the same motions, lifetime after lifetime after lifetime. Put back in the situation to be given the opportunity to make a better decision, to not identify with the ego. Okay, like let's say for example with this one, let's say it's something that you know happens in every city every weekend. It's going to happen downtown. So uh, two guys go out and they have too much to drink, and one guy looks at the other's girlfriend in the wrong way, and one guy gets jealous, so they fight about it because they're you know a jealousy and drunken and anger and that kind of stuff, and somebody gets stabbed or dies or something like that. Okay, each of those or both of those guys had the opportunity to not identify with gluttony, which caused them to drink, to not identify with jealousy, to not identify with anger. But each time they keep making the wrong decision, identifying with those egos, which feeds and sustains the egos, and at the expense of the essence, causing them to be caught in the same scenario again and again and again. And then nature puts them back in and says, okay, other opportunity, because you have to grow and develop this essence. That's why you're here. That's what you're supposed to do. So once again, are you going to make the right choice? No. Okay, let's try this another time. So we end up getting caught on this cycle 
running around the same tracks again and again and again. We carry that movie within us. And that sounds almost fate-like, doesn't it? Hmm. You're thinking, wait a second, if I've got this script, that's like, oh, that means that my whole life has been mapped out before me. If you don't awaken consciousness and don't study yourself, yeah, it is. Your whole life is mapped out, and it's going to be the same thing that has happened before. But remember that phrase that hung above the temples in Greece? Nasateyepsum, know thyself. Because one of the keys to doing that is to understand the ego. Because if we understand the ego, if we instead become conscious, then we get to rewrite that script. Okay, so don't take this uh, the wrong way and assume, well, everything, it's just fate, it's just destiny, no matter what I do, I'm bound to live the same life again and again. With the consciousness asleep, you're going to live the same life again and again, because the ego is driving the car, and it knows where it wants to go. If you let the ego drive the car, it's going to take you on the same path again and again and again. But we have the opportunity as humans, because we have that free will, we can wrestle control of the car from the ego, let the consciousness drive, and have it take us in a completely different direction. That's why it's important to self-observe. That's why it's important to learn about the different egos that we have and become able to identify the different egos and what they're trying to do and how to prevent them from happening and all that kind of stuff. Because if we don't do that, then the egos are driving the car and we don't know where they're taking us. Okay? Through learning and studying your past lives, which we'll talk about later on, there's practices and techniques to learn to develop that, we can get clues of where the egos might be wanting to take us by seeing how our previous lifetimes unfolded, but for right now we have no idea. The ego has control of the car, and we don't know where we're going. We firmly think we know where we're going, and we firmly think we're in control of the car, but the reality is different than where we're not. Okay, and this is what happens with the law of recurrence. <coughs> the interesting aspect of recurrence, though, is most often you recur with the same people, the same families, you're recurring in the same cities, the same nations, etc., etc., etc. We're all caught in our own little pattern depending on what karma has dictated, um, which, has a, uh, which relates to our previous existences, the good and the bad that we've done and the kind of corrective action that karma needs to put into play there. And we'll expand more on that last week. <coughs> Variations occur, as I mentioned earlier, due to the laws of karma and dharma, punishment or rewards for past actions. So it's not that every life is the exact repetition, because there are checks and balances that are put in place to account for previous behaviors. Okay, but for the most part, you're recurring with the same people, the same families, the same place, over and over and over again, which is why you have dreams, as I mentioned earlier, about best friends and significant others. Um, if strange relationships like parents and children, you're often, often changing roles from parent to child. If the strange thing is you often change sex as well. Mm. So sometimes you go from male to female. So that's something, and that's a strange dream to have where it's your significant other, but they don't look the same, and they're not the same sex. And it makes you question some stuff for a while. <clears throat> uh, if you're looking for some kind of Proof of that, we've all experienced deja vu before. You've all been to a strange place and went, I've never been here before, why does this seem strangely familiar? It's because you have been here before. Child prodigies, children that are born with all kinds of abilities that uh, suddenly seem to come out of nowhere, whether it's some musical talent, mathematical ability, whatever like that, and remembrance of past lives. Um, one of the neat things about compiling a dream diary is you dream about your past lives quite regularly. And by studying your dreams and keeping track of them, over time you're slowly able to assemble past lives. Yes. Just a quick comment uh, in agreement to what you were saying. Uh, I watched a, a news report. This young lady, she supposedly had a near-death experience, a young girl, and she supposedly went to heaven mm -hmm. to see God, met God, and she had a, came back, and she had an amazing ability to paint beautiful paintings of Jesus and, and other people in paradise. And she had never took a lesson in her life. So yeah, there's, ton, the there's fast tons of stories of that. If you go looking on the uh, internet for this kind of thing, there's tons of stories of, of yeah people that have suddenly developed abilities and that they've never ever been able to do before. They've never ever practiced, but they can sit down and you know play piano. <laughs> and it's usually after some sort of something that's happened with their like a near-death experience or a tragedy or a suicide attempt or a severe illness or something like that. Suddenly they have access to all these faculties mm -hmm. that they didn't have before. So yeah, we're, we're definitely talking about that kind of stuff. And just from your own dreams, over time with, when you learn to meditate more and when you start to compile more of your dreams, you actually start to assemble um, remembrances of your past lives, bits and pieces, and you can start to put together you know, where you worked and what you did 
and who you're around and does it ever answer a lot of questions for what you're doing in this life and why you have certain interests and why certain things have happened. It's a really interesting process. Um, yeah. So how is it that we can break free from the law of recurrence? Because that's kind of a scary thought to think that you're not in control of your life and it's just this cycle, this pre-written script that's going to happen again and again. How can we break free from that? Let's eliminate the ego. That's what it's all about. That's really what it comes to. There's so many things that come down to elimination of the ego. And this is another great example of that. The eagles are the actors in the movie. Think of your favorite movie. Now take out three of the actors. The movie has just drastically changed. There's whole scenes that can't play out anymore. That's going back to that scene of those guys that were drinking too much and jealous of his girlfriend and ended up getting in a fight and somebody got stabbed and somebody died. You take out those egos, that scene doesn't play out. You take out the ego of gluttony, they're not in the bar, or if they are, they haven't had too much to drink. You take out the ego of jealousy, and the one doesn't mind that the other one smiles at his girlfriend. You take out the ego of anger, and there's no fight. Okay, and that's a crazy example, but the moral of that story is somebody doesn't die in that scenario. Okay, it's a pretty severe example, but that happens again and again and again. This also uh, has ties. You've all heard the phrase, be the change that you want to see in the world. Because mm -hmm. there's two people in that scenario, right? Let's say only one of them self-observed. You've still changed the outcome of the other's life, haven't you? Because if the guy that did the stabbing had self-observed, then that event wouldn't happen. And if the guy that got stabbed self-observed, then he wouldn't have got into the fight in the first place. So it's not that both of those people have to awaken consciousness to have the course of their lives changed. Only one of them does. So that's why it's important on this path to not worry about what other people are doing and not try to change other people. It's about changing yourself because there's a domino effect. There's a ripple effect where one person changes it immediately affects a whole bunch of people around them to an extent that it's really even hard to, to visualize. And that's why, you know, people like Gandhi said, be the change that you want to see in the world. Because it all starts with you. It's not about anybody else changing. It's about you changing. Because you changing will drastically affect the people around you in that same concept. The idea that you pull one actor out of a scene, you've now affected what everybody else that was in that scene was doing, right? And you carry all these different actors, you carry all these different egos. If you eliminate that ego, the role no longer exists, and the corresponding scene can't be played out, and you get to write something else in. That's how we change the course of our existence. That's how we break free from the law of recurrence, is to eliminate the ego. And then when we keep eliminating, eliminating the egos, eventually we reach a point where we can break free from the law of return, and we're no longer bound to the physical world, and we can keep developing at a much higher level. Okay, we must eliminate the ego to liberate ourselves from the laws of return and recurrence. Okay, that's something that we actively have to work on. So, eliminating the ego is not just about awakening consciousness and all that kind of stuff. It's also about freeing ourselves from these laws. Because while we're caught by these laws, then we're caught stuck in nature. We're stuck in this three-dimensional world. We're stuck in this physical plane of existence and can't ascend any higher beyond this. So, it's caught living the same life again and again and again with the variations occurring from the law of karma. So are we okay with, with return to recurrence? Okay, yes? One more question. Um, is there an intelligent force that determines where we go, or is it all by chance? Is there something intelligent, someone saying, okay, that person needs to learn a, a lesson, put them there? It's, it's, not, it's not really an intelligence like one person. You okay. look at the law of karma, it's okay. kind of like almost like universal principle. And but what, what is it that we'll learn about that later? Yeah, and it's one of those things that's like, <laughs> yeah. it's like outside the realm of human comprehension. Is, it, is there a it's, universal intelligence, maybe? Well, that's what we would call the God, right? Yeah. The God, Allah, Brahma, whatever you want yeah. to call it. The that determines that, where we go. Yeah, and behind everything that has order, there's some mm -hmm. sort of a governor, that mm -hmm. governor being whatever, universal force, principle, intelligence, God, you want to picture a guy in a chair saying, you do this, you do that. But, doesn't matter. but we have the power of choice, Lee. Yes. Yeah. We can choose what drama or what right. scenario we want. Absolutely. Because we're put into those scenarios to be given the opportunity to make that choice. Are you going to choose this or are you going to choose that? And unfortunately for our, most of us, we're mm -hmm. stuck here because we keep making the wrong choice. We identify with the 
we know we don't identify with consciousness. I have a question. Uh, sure. What about the what we call the ascended masters? They obviously have uh, have sort of surpassed uh, this repetition or this law of recurrence. They've gone beyond that. And they've yep. learned their lesson, right? Yeah. And they've ascended. Yes, because the path to the ascended master is to eliminate the What is the difference between, you know, me, uh, somebody like me and a master is the master is free from ego. They realize that potential. They fully awaken that consciousness within themselves. But we have the potential also of Absolutely. doing that. Yeah. Absolutely. It's a choice. That's the neat thing. There's a chair here if you want to sneak up. <laughs> That's the thing. Um, we do have that choice. And that's a really important thing to remember, because if you're not careful, it, it, this stuff sounds a lot like fate, a lot like you don't have a choice and we're trapped into this and it's going to happen regardless. That's not true. We have free will. We have the choice in what we're going to do. We have the choice of identifying with the ego or identifying with the consciousness. The Bible says, choose today whom you will, fill, uh, will serve. Yeah. So, so, so we can choose. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, it's something that you see reflected in all the world's uh, religions, right? The idea of the devil on one shoulder and angel on the other, who you can listen to, right? They're both trying to get your attention, who's the one that you're going to listen to? And over time, if you listen to the right one, then you drastically change your course of your life. Yes. But the ascended ones somehow are helping the other ones. There's like some kind of a formula or a backup or teacher, student or kind of uh, things that, yeah. you know, like I say, that. Mm -hmm carries on. And that's the thing that um, another thing that's interesting to mention as well is you heard the expression when the student is ready the master appears. Mm -hmm. Oftentimes if you're willing to put the effort in there's um, you get all kinds of help and it's usually not a physical teacher by the way. Uh -huh. It's usually a teacher that you encounter in, in different states of existence whether it's through dreams, through meditation, <coughs> through astral projection as well. So so we return, we die, we come back. Happens over and over again, 108 times. And when we come back, we're bound by the law of recurrence, which is stop, rewind, play, over and over again, put in the same scenarios to be given that opportunity of choice again. How are you going to play it out this time? Are you going to choose this path or this path? Nope, that path again. That's just dictated the course of your life. Okay, let's try that again, shall we? Happens over and over and over again <coughs> until we make the decision to choose the other path. And there's so many things of life that appear like they aren't a choice. Remember when you're working properly with self-observation, when you work with identifying with a consciousness, there always is a choice. There's a fork in the road that immediately appears. Do I identify with the anger and go that route, or do I let it go and go this route? Okay? So many times in our life it seems like we're a victim of circumstances when really there's always a choice there. We just don't realize there's a choice there because we've never stopped to ask if there's a choice. We're just going through the same patterns, the same routines. After the law of return and recurrence, we're going to step back a bit and look at an even larger process, the law of evolution and involution. So in addition to the mechanical laws of return and recurrence, we're also subject to the law of evolution and involution. And during the first few classes of, of where we are right now in phase A, we spend a lot of time talking about the different laws governing our existence. Because a lot of the suffering that we encounter in life is as a result of not understanding all the different laws that are affecting our existence. So many times we find ourselves going against the flow, so to speak, because we don't really, really know all these different laws that are governing what we're doing. And evolution and involution are example of another set of larger laws affecting the outcome of our life and lives. We see the force of evolution present in the seed that germinates and grows into a plant, but then we see involution present when the plant ages, withers, and dies. What goes up must come down, right? We see that surrounding us. The law of evolution and involution are everywhere. The two stages are the same thing. You, it's one of those laws that you can't really deny. It surrounds you everywhere. It's governing your own life. It's governing the physical world around you at different levels. The law of evolution and involution is something that we see everywhere that we look. The whole concept of what goes up must come down. When you're looking at the law of evolution and involution, uh, in India it was symbolized by something called the wheel of samsara. It was also known as the cycle of existence, or to get really fancy, the path of transmigration. Okay, this is a, a, something that was re reflected really well in India. They had this concept of a wheel that you were trapped on going around and around and around. 
The Wheel of Samsara, Cycle of Existence, or Path of Transmigration, describes the journey, the essence goes, the divine seed, the divine spark within you. It describes the journey that essence goes through numerous existences and numerous kingdoms. Okay, the different existences, the different lifetimes it has in the various kingdoms of creation, the various levels of, of life, or the various levels of manifestation, so to speak. And here's a couple different depictions. Uh, this is a, an Indian Hindu depiction. Um, the wheel of samsara is sitting right here. Uh, there's this nasty kind of monster that's mm -hmm. spinning the wheel around and round. Um, that monster represents the third dimensional forces of nature, so to speak, which is driving that wheel. Up at the top, there's these very ascended heavenly kind of beings. Mm -hmm. Down at the bottom, there's these fire-breathing demon kind of things. And this is just people caught around here and you can see that the center of the wheel is divided into different sections. This is a medieval woodcut depicting the same thing. Um, here there's an angelic being that's driving this wheel and you can see that there's people that are going down. The one at the bottom is uh, dressed all in black. Then there's people coming up and the one at the top is dressed in armor with this sword and this uh, cross gold thing there. So obviously to be at the top of that wheel is something special here and the bottom is kind of dark and there's some sort of spiritual force that's driving the turn of that wheel. And if you're familiar with tarot cards in the Rider Waite tarot deck, that's how you see the um, that wheel of some sort depicted on that as well. Same kind of, you know, there's the devil, there's the heavenly beings, the sphinx, the sword at the top, you know, the whole concept of the rotation. <coughs> oh, sorry. It's all right. Um, the uh, involution and evolution, mm -hmm. are those, uh, do those affect, I guess they would affect both, but is that is that specifically for the individual or is that for a whole collective species? It, it happens at all kinds of different levels. Okay. So yeah, as a whole collective species, you're, you're governed by that as well. Okay. It happens, it's one of those things that just keeps, you step back, it just keeps playing by itself. So you can get out and then hopefully get, get off before your whole species is on a yeah. collision. Yeah, you mean that we want to we wanna break free from Or that. out of back. <coughs> yeah. Okay. The wheel then is describing the path of the essence. It's describing the different levels of existence, the essence you carry within you. That transmigration, is, think of it as a travel, travel across, okay? Uh, it's literally the growth and development of your soul. That's actually what the path of transmigration is describing. That's what the wheel of Samsara is describing. The journey that the essence you carry within has been on. Uh, when you look at it this way, uh, there's different levels of existence. They're typ typically broken down into four different kingdoms. You've got the mineral kingdom, the plant kingdom, the animal kingdom, and then the human kingdom. So what you see is the essence begins at a lower level. It begins in the mineral kingdom, evolves to the plant kingdom, evolves to the animal kingdom, until finally reaching the human kingdom. So yes, you have been animals, plants, and rocks before. <laughs> wow. <laughs> which is a really strange concept, but everything had the essence then. If you look at it from this perspective, the essence is just simply the animating principle behind all things. Right? People say, you know, God is everywhere and in everything because everything has some form of a life force. Everything has some form of an animating principle. Definitely animals have a life force. Definitely plants have a life force. If you look at a rock and you say, well, a rock's not living. It's just at a much slower time frame. But that rock had a beginning and had an end. That rock went through a period of being formed and developed and all that kind of stuff, which is really weird to think about, but nonetheless, it happens. So your essence... What you carry within you, the life force that you carry within has been recycled many times before. That essence, that life force you carry within has spent times as the elementals of the rocks, plants, and animals. Okay? People know animals have spirits, right? The concept of, you know, spirit guides. And like, that's essences of animals. Okay? How, do people, how did ancient people know about healing properties of plants? Because they're able to communicate with the elementals of the plant. Yes? <coughs> I, I'm just curious. You got my imagination going. Is that what what many uh, Celtic mythology and other uh, mythology in in in, in Dan Denmark and, and Norway talk about fairies? Yeah, absolutely. This this and is your fairies and your gnomes flying and girls yeah, yep. with wings. Yep, yep, yep. That's, that's what we're talking about. Wow. Yeah, that's what the ancient people would see, and that's what they would uh, re re represent those as. I forgot. I'll think of it again. Okay. So the essence spends time as elementals of rocks, plants, and animals, which is... It's, oh, that's right. 
do these, uh, let's say, an elemental or a rock or a mineral or a crystal, does that have an astral being? Yep. Okay. And that would correspond to what he was talking yep. about? Okay, cool. And these are things that you can communicate on and that you can actually get in touch with and that you can contact. Okay. That's why the saying is God is in all things and God is in everywhere, right? Um, it's the same idea. And that's why many indigenous people said that that rock has a spirit, that river has a spirit, that tree has a spirit, that animal has a spirit, and you can communicate with these spirits. Yes? It's the same thing as the DNA. They say where we got DNA that's the same as the earth and, yeah. and all the fabrics of, of yeah. life. And yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. That's and you know that's what people, we're all the same because we all carry the same life force. And if you're having trouble imagining soul and essence and consciousness, mm -hmm. just think of it as the animating principle behind all things. It's the source of all life, right? And life happens at different levels. Yes, there's human life, but the plant life and the animal there's life happening at different levels all around us. And that's why we see the ancient cultures making comments like that. And that's why you know if you ever had the chance to talk to, you know, healers and, and things like that. This is what they're tapping into. This is why they work with those plants and that's why they know these plants do those things and you know that's why the concept of spirit guides and all that stuff comes from. It's all surrounding us. It's always there all the time. We just don't really pay attention to it anymore. So let's just show you how the wheel of samsara works. Um this is heaven because it's like sky and I got like a beams of light coming out. <laughs> this is hell because it's, it's like fire, right? Um, so there we'll stick the Wheel of Samsara right on the top of that. So what we see uh, reflected in the Wheel of Samsara is we see the inferior regions, the, the hell for lack of a better term, and we'll talk more about hell later, and we see the superior regions, the, the heavens on top. Now as the concept of heaven and hell, we're talking dimensions here. The ancient people, when they looked or had experiences in the higher dimensions, they said, oh it's beautiful, it's like a wonderful place, there's all these really nice beings, and that's where we got the concept of paradise or heaven from. It's just interaction in the higher dimensions. If you want to get Kabbalistic in the tree of life, the higher, this is the physical world right here. The higher dimensions are everything above us. This is just a map for navigating through those higher dimensions. Okay? So the higher dimensions became the paradises, became the heavens of the various world religions. Okay? Because as we'll see later on, in the higher dimension, all we see are self-realized beings. All we see are beings who have eliminated the ego. All we see are beings that are developing their spiritual side. So there's less pain, there's less suffering, there's less mechanicity, and that's why it's such a beautiful, happy place that everybody wants to get to. Now, the opposite side of the scale, what we see in the infra dimensions, the dimensions below us, we don't see any pure spiritual awakened beings. Mm -hmm. We see beings full of darkness and ego. And it's uh, because of that, it's real heavy, it's real uh, mechanical, there's a lot of suffering, and that spawned the concept of the various hells of the world's religions. The entities we encounter and communicate with in the higher dimensions, all those entities became the gods, goddesses, deities, angels of the world's religions. The beings that you can unfortunately encounter and communicate in the other dimensions became the idea of demons and all that kind of bad stuff. Okay? So the Wheel of Samsara is situated between the higher dimensions and the lower dimensions. What we see on one side is the process of evolution. Okay, that rising as we go from a lower region up to a higher region. On the other side of the wheel, so, sorry, starting with the mineral kingdom, the mineral kingdom, you can think of that as basically a little bit of a level, a little bit of a step up from hell. We always think of hell in the center of the world, right? Lava and all that kind of stuff, mm -hmm. which is where minerals are formed, oddly enough. So we start down there in the mineral kingdom. So our essence, our soul, right up here at the top, this is basically God, for lack of all things. Okay? And then what happens is, this is the great ocean from which we're all pulled, and a drop of that great ocean is taken and planted right down there, okay, in the mineral kingdom. The idea being that growth and development should have been this path that traveled all the way back <coughs> to the source until we reunite from where we came. Okay, so that seed, is very, that essence is first planted in the mineral <coughs> kingdom. And that essence was supposed to undergo a continuous state of development traveling from level to level to level, stepping up through all these little circles that you see here. It was to travel through all these levels of existence until it eventually emerged itself back with the source. Okay, reunited with God for lack of a better term. Remember, you gotta think of it like this, it's like God created creation and then wanted to experience it, wasn't able to experiencing it, experience it 
him or herself directly, so send a little part of him down there that would come back up and bring all that experience back to him or her or it or whatever you want to think of that. That was kind of the idea. So we start down here in the mineral kingdom. Your essence spends time developing the mineral kingdom until it finally graduates, so to speak, and then transitions to the plant kingdom. From there, it goes up into the animal kingdom until eventually it reaches the kingdom of human. That was supposed to continue, okay? Because the next step after human is angelic. Now remember this, this, this thrones, dominions, cherubs, angels, archangels, all that kind of stuff? That just describes the different beings that dwell in different states of existence. So those were levels, just like you have mineral, plant, animal, human, and it was angel, archangel, cherub, dominion, throne, all these other different levels of existence. Okay, so this was supposed to be a ladder that climbed all the way up. But something happened right here. Stop. Okay, the interesting thing, when transitioning from animal to human, there's really one thing that separates humans from animals, and that's the intellect. And with the intellect came free will. Animals do what they do instinctively. Plants do what they do instinctively. Minerals do what they do. There's no free will there. Okay, but when we reach this level, the thing that changes is there's suddenly free will. And that gave us the ability to choose. And unfortunately, that gave us the ability to choose wrong. Okay? When the essence falls into the human kingdom, it becomes distracted. It becomes distracted by want and desire and falls for the illusion of the physical world. And that gives birth to the ego. So when we reach this level, we get trapped by the ego. And the ego is like an anchor. It weighs us down. So rather than traveling up to the next level, which is angelic, we can't get up there while we carry the ego. Think of a Christian concept, substitute ego for sin, it's the same thing. You can't get into heaven while you're full of sin, right? That was the same idea. You can't get up to this next level while you carry all this ego. This is where we have those 108 lifetimes. If after those 108 lifetimes we haven't broken those chains, we haven't eliminated the ego, guess what happens? The process of involution kicks in and then drags the essence back down the other way. This is nature's recycling program. Okay, so from human, we transition back to animal, or involute to animal, back to plant, run through that whole cycle again. And this brings up an interesting concept, because this, there's like a gray line here between human and animal on both sides of this equation. Now, right here, there's animals that are like basically one lifetime away from becoming human. Like an animal that when that animal dies, that essence will transition into this human kingdom. There's like this gray area there. There's a lot of overlap. These, uh, on this gray area right here, this overlap, that's where we see a lot of the, uh, you know, the magic animals. Animals like lions and eagles and horses and dogs and cats and falcons and all that kind of stuff. Animals that were usually kept close to humans and animals that were usually revered and worshipped. Because in some states, they're actually better off than us, because when they die, they're going to come back as a pure essence that's untainted and untouched by the human kingdom until they spend some time here and become all corrupted and then they get sucked on the other side. And just like that too, there are some animals right here on this line that used to be human a lifetime ago. And these are your animals that usually we have an aversion for. These are your animals like pigs and rats and all that kind of stuff. Okay, And that's why ancient cultures in many times would say there's animals you can eat and there's animals you can't eat. When you think of looking at a, a, a even kosher or our Muslim diet, um, you can't eat things like you know, goats and pigs because they were a the rat. You know, and you can't eat this animal. You can't. Bad animals were the ones that lived here because they thought that by eating that animal you'd be ingesting all that negativity, you'd be consuming all that ego and all that darkness that was on the process of going back down. So the idea of clean versus unclean animals was describing the relationship on both sides of that. Do you, I'm sorry, do you believe that? Do you, I mean, what I mean, do you believe it's right, it's, should we shouldn't eat pork, or we shouldn't eat... I believe that it's everyone's it's, it's, it's own business, it's a personal decision. It's not going to affect our spirituality, though? Um, it's only up to you. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I don't yeah. preach on what other people should or shouldn't eat. Okay. But uh, all I'm just saying is if you look into the religious studies, there was forbidden animals or forbidden yeah, right. foods and there was allowed foods. And where did that come from? Yeah. This is where that come from. Yeah. Um, pigs were seen as a, a level below a human. The idea being that they had been human, they had had those 108 lifetimes, they were full of all that really powerful ego. Right. And gee, you don't want to eat that, do you? But a lot of other animals, like cows, is another, in India, cows are sacred, right? right? The idea being that that cow was 
especially the neck, when that cow died, that essence, that life force was going to enter the human kingdom as a pure child. Well, like without without offending anyone's beliefs, like mm -hmm. it, it, like if I want to become a more elevated person, do I have to become a vegan? The, to become out without getting involved in people's choices, I can be elevated without having to be picky. Yeah, he did, there's nothing about uh, spirituality that says you have to be vegetarian. Or vegan. Okay. And, uh, just as a side note to that, because I know people often ask about that, um, but Master Sam Al is that guy right there. He's the guy that was responsible for the founding of the modern, modern Gnostic movement. He had a wife that was Little Lantus, which is right there, and she was specifically asked one day, um, you know, sh what should you eat, and you know, should I eat meat, or should I eat this, and should I eat that, and her quote, I really love this, if humanity spent as much time worrying what came out of their mouth, as what they put into it, it would be a completely different world. The idea being that you cause more problems with what you say than with what you actually eat. You accrue more karma and suffering for yourself with what comes out than what you put in. And if people were so careful about, or as careful with what they said as to what they eat, then you'd be in a different environment altogether. So, food for thought. Um, <laughs> So there's, that's the process of evolution, the process of evolution. Now, right here, there's, a, there's this interesting point of transition. Um, and what we call that, we call that the point of revolution. Remember that woodcut where that armor, that knight was sitting there with the armor and his sword? That's where the fight is. That's where the battle is. Okay? Because we have to undergo a revolution. We have to go undergo a revolution of our psychology in order to break free from the wheel of samsara, to break free from the ego, to continue to rise up to not be drawn back down. It's the ego that traps us here. When we reach the human kingdom, it's desire that gives birth to the eye. It's desire that gives birth to the ego. That's why we find ourselves trapped here. Okay? At this point, that's where we have to strap on the armor, grab the sword, and begin the battle. And the battle is the battle of the, the, battle of the self. Okay? It's the battle of the consciousness. Okay? Because to undergo, to free ourselves from the ego, allows us to transition to the next level, to undergo that spiritual revolution and continue to ascend on the higher levels. That's how we break free from the wheel of samsara. That's how it was supposed to be. It wasn't supposed to be a wheel that spins round and round. It was a lad, supposed to be a ladder that went from top to bottom. But we get stuck at this point and find ourselves grinding around again and again and again on this ladder, going from different states back down again over and over. And then how long is that whole entire wheel? It's a long About time. <laughs> like a gajillion? Literally a gajillion. Actually, years. I, have some, I have some, some numbers coming up. Okay. Just kind of just food for thought. So, once we reach the human kingdom, we're given those 108 lives with which to liberate ourselves. 108 <coughs> lives to undergo that revolution, break free from the ego, and transition. Okay? To the next level of existence. <clears throat> Um, the 108 lies come from the 108 beads on Buddha's necklace, the 108 skulls that he carries, one skull representing each life, and we're kind of holding that thought for later on when we get more into numerology and Kabbalah, where that number becomes a lot more significant. Uh, if we don't self-realize in those 108 lives, if we can't free from ourselves from that ego, we start the process of involution, going back down again. Okay, that whole concept of if we don't break free, then we're caught back on the other side, we're caught on the involutionary side of that wheel, eventually returning back all the way down to the mineral kingdom. The mineral kingdom is the inferno, it's the hells of the various religions. Okay, and every religion has a concept of the inferno and hell, right? So let's talk about hell, shall we? While we're on the subject. Most people, unfortunately, in this day and age, descend to the infernal regions, never, never liberating themselves from the wheel of samsara. Okay? They don't undergo that decision to make a change. They don't develop the consciousness. They don't eliminate the ego. So they find themselves trapped on that wheel, being literally dragged to hell, so to speak. <clears throat> Evolution is a process of complication. The essence becomes more and more complicated. From lifetime to lifetime, the ego in the human kingdom becomes more and more complicated. Okay, because with each lifetime we keep feeding the ego. So what's it gonna do? Go bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. If nature didn't step in to correct that, that would be an imbalance, right? That means basically ego, darkness, whatever you want to call it, would grow without limit, would be unbounded in its growth. If you know anything about nature or studying nature, it's nature always maintains a balance. What goes up must come down. What grows has to shrink. Okay? If 
that ego was allowed to continue unchecked, the essence would be permanently trapped by the ego, would it not? Because if the ego is just allowed to grow and grow and grow, then the essence would find itself, or the essence, divinity would find itself totally trapped in darkness, which is a process that isn't very balanced at all, and it's kind of really depressing. That's essentially then saying that evil would develop without limits and would keep growing infinitely, which is not a state of balance. The infernal regions actually play a really important role then. Hell literally plays a role in the grand scheme of things. In the inferno, the ego is reduced to dust. The essence is purified, set free, and evolves anew. Hell is not a place of eternal suffering. It's a place of renewal. It's a place of rebirth. It's nature's recycling program, so to speak. Okay, so the wheel of samsara is just scales tipping from one side to the other as that balance is maintained in all time. What is it that suffers in the inferno? It's the ego that suffers. It's the false self. Okay? The essence is purified, set free, and evolves anew. So that essence is always going to evolve, and that essence will always be purified. Okay, it's just the ego is what grows and shrinks and grows and shrinks on that cycle unless we break free from that ego. Okay, it's nature's recycling program. That purified essence hops on the wheel of samsara for another ride, going from the mineral kingdom through the plant and animal kingdoms until it reaches the human state once again. Okay, so this Christianity kind of little, little, you know, led us a little bit astray with the concept of the soul by saying, hey, you got it. Just do the right thing and you get to keep it. When it's really something we have to earn. And they said, oh, hell is eternal suffering. Once you go down there, you never come back. But the Catholics have a slightly augmented version of that. Yeah. Yeah, most of the world's religions do. Um, and it's interesting in that when you look at the world's religions, the concept of, of hell, usually you don't see it very often reflected as a, a place of eternal suffering. I mean, most of the, think of the story of uh, a Hercules going down to Hades. Hell is this place you can go down to, fight some monsters, and come back. Okay, it wasn't this place where you went and stayed forever. That was more of an event of early Christianity, the idea that if you did the really bad things, then you went down and you never came back. But in as much as there's, uh, strictly for Catholicism, there's purgatory hell and there's hell hell. Mm -hmm. Where yeah. you can't come, can you even come back from purgatory? The purgatory okay. is where you go when you're waiting for your next it's body. A place. It's a waiting it's place. A waiting room. Yeah, purgatory is the waiting room. Okay. When you lose your physical, we'll talk about that later. But you know when no, we no, talk about, you know when we talk about return and recurrence, you die, you come back. Yeah. In the space between dying and coming back, it's what they call that like a purgatory. Party? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Party, same idea. That's yeah. where spirits are. Mm -hmm. That's the fifth dimension. You go there every night when you sleep. Purgatory, fifth dimension, Bardo, same thing. I have a question about this. Yep. Let's say, as far as I'm aware, everybody in this room has the ego of fear. Yes. Is there only one ego of fear that exists in everybody as the same individual? No, you have your own personalized manifestation. So when you come onto the wheel as a new child, you might accept those into your life falsely, and they will take over your life. But yep. as a child that dies and is born again, are those same egos inherently in you, or do they come and find you again? They, it sounds weird, they literally come and find you again, because the ego... But they are the same ones. They are the, the same previous. ones. The ego can't manifest until the personality develops. Which so is a person has to consciously accept the egos. Mm, it's not consciously. It's Subconsciously, but with their own action. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, but it's a process that you, at that age, have and no control over. Do the egos come from God or from the Demiurge? Uh, they, or from the, the antithesis of God. The antithesis of God. See, that gets complicated because really, um, they are the, they are their own entities. They exist in their so own. So can they go world. up the wheel? No. So they're not from God. They're not from the higher dimensions. They're from the lower dimensions. Okay. It gets. Don't get too much into it, but the gate to the infernal regions, the gate to hell, is actually found in the fifth dimension, which is above. Yeah. Us. Okay. You've got okay. to go Fair up enough. to go down. I've, I remember you saying that. Yeah, which time. is kind of like a strange concept to think about. Got to get up to um, get down. You know when everyone looks at a baby like, oh, the baby's so cute, it's a... Yeah. What you see when you look at a child that young is the pure essence. There is no ego there. But as time goes on, as that child starts to develop and more blocks of the personality <coughs> fall into place, then the ego can manifest. Because the ego needs the car to drive. As the car gets built, then the ego moves in to take control of the wheel. 
Okay, so if a new essence is there's new eagles that distract them, but as you come back and return, you're carrying your old eagles with you. They literally just wait for them. And it's said that um, uh, if you have your consciousness developed to a certain degree, people that can see things in the higher dimensions, apparently you can literally see them surrounding the child in the crib sort of thing, waiting for their opportunity to, to get in and manifest, which is a disturbing vision oh, and stuff. Uh, sorry, That's are okay. these the same, you, I remember we were, we were talking at the uh, astral projection mm -hmm. meeting, and I asked you a question about the archons, are, are the egos what we call the archons? Yeah. Or that's something totally, yeah. so these are intelligent, but uh, heartless creatures, right? You can think of it like that. They're, 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 they're like the Terminators. Uh, yeah. Or machine, <laughs> but she, like, I, I heard another Gnostic person say that these are like spiritual machines. They have kind no, no, no soul, no heart, no compassion, just pure intelligence. Yeah, and they just want to—they want to manifest for a particular yeah. reason. There's, they, they want that particular energy, and they do whatever they need to do yeah. to, to exactly. get that. So if you want to look at it that way, the robotic and you can kind see of people heartless. having these attributes in prices of power. Yeah, and yeah, very cool. Yeah, but you have to like think of them as, as not as like beings or creatures or. Or anything like they're not like that. It's just it's an intelligence. It's just a level of intelligence. They don't have a physical body, so to speak. It's not like they're things or anything else like that. They're just it's just intelligences. Um, and we've all we all feel them. We've all been under the influence of anger and all that kind of stuff. That's the one that most people can easily identify with. That is an ego. Yeah. Uh, Leo, uh, speaking or uh, Lee, uh, speaking of egos, uh, I think there's some disagreement as to what the what constitutes an ego. Um, I have a hard time understanding uh, the ego as being an entity, mm -hmm. whereas others' teachings say that an ego is, is, is our character, is our personality that we develop. It's a behavior. Yes, they're, they're and, both. And they're the both. ego uh, wants to survive, so it fights to survive. Yeah, it is, it, is, it, is a, it is a character that we exhibit, it is our personality, it is our behavior. Those things as a manifestation of an external intelligence that's mm, directing okay. us in a particular course. But a natural spiritual entity are we talking about? Yeah. Okay. It resides in the it resides in the fifth dimension. Um, you can't see is, it here. You Does can't it? yeah, you can't see it here, but and they don't manifest directly in this dimension, but they influence through us. So when you're angry, you're feeling the influence of anger. Remember we're like marionettes, we're like puppets dancing. The strings attaching to the puppets are the five centers of the human machine, intellectual center, emotional, instinctive, motor, and sexual. And the puppet hand way up top here, that's the ego in the fifth dimension that's, that's influencing it, so to speak. It's not like they manifest here, it's not like they do things here, they just influence through us. So, it, excuse me, is this where the, uh, some religions get the idea about demons and uh, Satan, the devil, and all these things? They're actually talking about those egos, aren't they? Yeah, the, the angel on your shoulder was your consciousness, your higher self, the divine side. The devil on that shoulder was was the various egos. Do this, do this. No, don't do that. That's that eternal battle that we're, we're caught between those two polarities. We're caught in a pull this direction and a pull that direction. The so, pull towards up and versus the pull towards but down. But isn't that the part of the life is to get to the fourth and then to the fifth dimension? Like that's yep. our steps that we're supposed to... Our purpose. Yep, to, is to climb ascend. that ladder to ascend. But yeah. we got distracted at the lower levels and yeah, totally forgot that we were actually on a ladder and think that this is the be all end all and this is what we're caught up in. Mm -hmm. And when we get into stuff later on, um, it's really interesting to see that everything you see before doesn't even really exist. Mm -hmm. And all this external stuff doesn't exist external. It's all in your head, it's all internal. Mm -hmm. So we'll get more into that later on. Yep. Yeah. So, so often we think that people, let's say in this, culture or this you know, place um, who are insecure, who are have self-esteem, have self-confident is issues to deal with, that we see that as negative. But it almost seems like that's a good place to be because that opens up the possibility to uh, yes and no, because you can have an ego that feeds on that as well. You can have an ego that feeds on self-loathing and feeds on low self-confidence, and you, you have egos that feed on feelings of worthlessness and despair. Just like, you know, we just, we as a culture polarize certain egos, and we say, this type of ego is very beneficial, because it allows you to get really far and acquire lots of money and assets and stuff like that, and this ego is not so good. And don't forget that of all things, you know, we, you know, being proud is good, right? 
But don't forget, pride is one of the seven deadly sins. And we forget, we think of, oh, you know, uh, you know, uh, gluttony is bad, and you know, lust is bad, and you know, anger is bad. But we forget about pride. Well, I think if you're, if you're being, if you're observing yourself, you could probably use those attributes of yourself through your stronger willpower to work on things like meekness as opposed to wimpiness or as opposed to shyness which could be fear could be other things and you could yeah it's kind yeah, of it's all they're all just manifestations of the same thing someone who had a, a lower self-esteem might be more open to changing and developing versus somebody that was you know imagine a high-powered executive earning a million dollars a year try telling him that he's got issues about his personality and that he's imperfect and that he needs to work on himself but you find somebody who's depressed with a low self-esteem they'll be more inclined to say yeah yeah i don't want to be like this anymore i really want to change how i am so in on the original comment maybe there are states that people would be more open to that and usually most people uh, that seek a spiritual path usually have some aspect of their life or their personality that is a challenge for them. It's very rare to encounter someone on a spiritual path that as far as society is concerned is you know, doing great, right? It's usually people that are, you know, have that reflection that you know, there's really something more changed, something I'm not happy with. And that inner drive to change comes from that essence, right? Um, so speaking of how... Excuse me. But well, it seems to me that the ego is actually part of evolution. Because if you didn't have ego, what are you going to evolve off or from? Like evolve. So it means it seems that like like what you said. So yeah, it's definitely a counterforce. Like I said, you see in nature, there's always you know imagine a pendulum swinging. For every left, there's going to be a right. There's always counterforces to oppose other forces that are in place. So yeah, to a certain extent, it's acting as a counterforce to that process of evolution. But isn't isn't uh, free will uh, evolution and ego is a product of free will? Uh, ego being yeah, ego being a product of free will. Okay, so yeah. ego would the ego still be a an attribute of evolution? It's not a direct result of evolution, but as far as we're concerned, it's a part of it. It's something that we encounter on the in or during the process of evolution. It's a counteractive, or it's a, a, a compulsive or an opposite force to the process of evolution that we encounter. That we have to eliminate or break free in order to continue on that path. It's like think of Magnus, right? Having the pulling forces. We're trying to go up, but there's an equal and opposite pull going down. There's a struggle. There's a revolution to break free from that pull to continue going up. If we give into it. If there's an equal, you know, if we came up, there's an equal pull to come down. It's it's that revolution that's required to break free from that to transition to the next level. Okay, because there's different states of existence happening on different levels, and there's always these key points where you have to break free in order to rise again. And we're at one of those apexes right now in the human kingdom where we can break free and then travel the next set of existence. And we won't get too much into it, but that's basically where we are right here. But that happens again. It, different levels of existence. It's not like once we've broken free from the human kingdom, it's smooth sailing all the way to the top. Yeah, no. <laughs> we encounter different points along the journey as well, where we have to break th through once again. Okay, but we're at that point where we have to make that break, because if not, we end up back down in the infernal regions. Speaking of hell, so the ego, the ego has to be as dissolved. Um, it's either dissolved in the inferno as part of the mechanical process of nature, so it's either literally you know, burned away in hell, so to speak, freeing that essence, or we can choose to break free from the wheel of samsara and voluntarily dissolve our ego now. Sooner or later, we're going to face what we call the second death. The second death is the death of the ego. We have a choice. We have to do that now consciously at the top of that wheel of samsara so we can simply transition to the next level, or we have to wait to be dragged all the way back down again, have that ego that second death occur in the inferno, and then go through that whole process of evolution again, only to be caught up in the ego once more, and then have to go through that whole process again and again and again. The idea being that if we undergo that conscious death here and now, then we can transition to the next level. We can continue developing at a, at a much higher level. Uh, the inferno, so consequently, looking back to the concept of Christian hell, the inferno does not await only the evil and perverse, it awaits all those who have lived their 108 lives without self-realization. 
right? Because remember, the Bible said, well, you can't get to heaven unless you're free from sin. <coughs> um, and being free from sin involves a little more than <coughs> living a horrible life, but in the last five minutes before your death, kind of like absolving yourself from sins and doing some wine and eating a cracker and saying, yeah, finally. Um, it's a, a process of development, right? It's a, it's a lifelong process. So it's not the case of, well, that hell isn't just for, you know, murderers and, and horrible people like that. It's part of nature's recycling program. It's a way to keep the ego in check and to purify the essence. Okay, so if you don't work on developing your consciousness, everybody goes to hell. Well, I, I heard, too, that there really is no hell. It's just that man or somebody in the past made that as hell for the religious sake of scaring people. Yes. Because hell, like you say, is the name, but it's not really hell. It's, like you said, a purification. But yep. they make it sound like a real bad place where, again, yeah, it is, but it I isn't think. in the world. So it's <laughs> like, it's like, it's not... I don't know how to say it. It's to scare people. But yeah, I, fear I tend is to, one of the things that you got to overcome. Yeah, I, I, I tend to make a rip on Christianity a lot. I don't really intend to, but you have to remember that Christianity started as a more of a political movement to control people than it was yes. an actual yeah. religious yeah. expression. Yeah. Back to the Council of Nicaea in yeah. 300 and something odd. When they, yeah, Constantine, when they decided, okay, we need a way to unite all these tribes and states that aren't getting along, you know, we'll really do that. A common religion. And since I am the emperor, this is what it's going to be. Mm -hmm. And that's when they decided on the concept of Christianity, let's pick this guy Jesus, let's assemble his books together and call the Bible and all that kind of stuff. And it was more of a political so movement. And that gets complicated because you have different Bibles that can be on there. Yeah, I but it's a either control mechanism because, you know, you, you know, how am I going to get you to do what I say? Um, yeah. Ooh, hell. Yeah. Could hellfire perhaps hell not be what uh, mainstream churches have pictured as horrible demon monsters poking with pitchforks and fire and fire and burning the, the, the and fire. slicing. Could it be actually like a, a place like this place, but different? Like Well, we'll get, in, we'll get into that later on because hell, hell has actually levels. Yeah. There's like nine levels to hell, believe it or not. This is the level where you're tested. Right. So is there actually torture? Yeah. yeah. No, we're not like. Is it not the like physical tradition? torture? Not like, not like <laughs> pitchforks and stuff like that. We'll get into that later. Like we're tortured in the third dimension already. We'll get into that later on. There's different levels of hell. There's there's a whole class on hell later on. Okay. Right. There's a whole class on hell. If you want to get an idea of what it looks like, there was a, a, an Italian author many years ago that wrote an awesome map of hell and what it's all about, and that's Dante's Inferno. Right. Dante yeah, Alighieri wrote a book called Inferno. Yeah. There you go. He had the Paradiso, which is all about what heaven was, and they had the Inferno, which is all about what hell was. This is somebody that was taken around and toured these areas, and then disguised the esoteric teachings as poetry. So if you really want to know about hell, read that book, because it's pretty much spot on. Yeah. I, I just think it's funny, because I don't want to learn about hell. I want to go the other way. Yeah, I mean, but I don't want to dwell on the, on the other part. Oh, by the way, you've already all been there before. Yeah, I wouldn't doubt it. Wow. Um, who, have you ever had a nightmare? Yes. That's where you live. I heard that was like fire and everywhere. If you, it doesn't have any kind of nightmare, like uh, when you go to sleep at night, you go into the fifth dimension, right? Yeah. And from the fifth dimension, you can experience the normal fifth dimension, which is the astral state. Or through the fifth dimension, you, there's the gateway where you deck to the lower dimension. And if you're not careful and you wander in the wrong direction, so to speak, you actually end up in hell. And you've had that experience. Look at the nightmare is that you basically in hell before. You're like, oh, what's hell like? You've been there. <laughs> Some people go more often than others, but you've all experienced what it's like to be in the lower regions. And later on, as part of the studies, you'll see that you, you, know, you have to descend in order to ascend. I mean, that's a, a message that's uh, quite strong in uh, uh, Dante's Inferno. He gets shown what's happening in the levels of hell and then taken up into, into heaven. Um, and that's the story, too, of a lot of the world's religions, right? The, the Hercules had to go down to Hades to rescue the, the damsel in distress, so to speak. That's a common theme of religion. So that's part of the journey. And that's for much later on. Uh, long story short, um, don't think just because you're a nice person, you're not going to go. <laughs> oh, great. <laughs> yeah, it's, you have to eliminate the ego. You have to purify oneself. And even the Bible says only those without sin can enter the gates of heaven. Well, remember, sin and ego are interchangeable. Uh, oh, good quote. Every tree which bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. It's right from the Bible for it. The idea being that we're, 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 we're planted. We're, you know, we're supposed to bear fruit. Fruit in the awakened consciousness. Fruit in the soul. If the tree is not producing the fruit, you just plant another one. Why keep messing with the same tree? Okay? Uh, each, oh, this is where we get more, more numbers. Uh, each essence completes 3,000 cycles around the wheel of samsara with 108 human lives on each cycle. 
if you're doing your math right now, that gives you a total of 324,000 opportunities for self-realization. And unfortunately, that is not enough <laughs> for some people. If you're keeping track of numbers, you see that adds up to nine again. Okay. Um, so this is like a long, drawn-out cycle, right? That happens over a really long period of time. It's interesting to note that uh, no matter what happens, we always go back to the source where we came. There's two ways to go, either as a victor or a failure. Either as an ascended, awakened being, or as like a dud, so to speak. New essences that arrive for the first time in the human kingdom fall into many errors. <coughs> Egos are created and we acquire karma. So as I mentioned earlier, when we come back up, we hit the human kingdom, we're given that free will and all that kind of stuff, and that's where we go astray. That's where we fall into the errors that we find. We falsely identify with the illusion before us, we become distracted, we get caught up in the whole concept of want and desire. That's where the egos are born, uh, fed, and, and sustained. Uh, desire is what gives birth to the I, want, because we want stuff, right? We want all kinds of stuff. We want not only things like money and cars and houses and possessions, we want control of people, we want, we want all kinds of things. It's really desire that gives birth to the I. And you see a huge component of the ego of greed in there as well. Doesn't matter what you have, it's never enough, right? You're never happy. Question? So this is on the Earth only, or nothing from any other universes or other places that? Yeah, the Earth is the uh, the Earth is the bad one. We'll get into other places later on, but uh, unfortunately, of all the places you could end up, this uh, is the bad one. Because I heard Earth is the newest part when there's other old souls that come in to help us here. Uh, and so that's what gets me messed up sometimes as you're talking about all the ones for Earth, but from other... Remember everything has a cycle, or a rise and a fall? So does this planet. And it's been through different states of existence. It's been through its own mineral planet, animal kingdom. Yeah. It's caught on its own wheel, which brings into the old souls, new souls, different races. I think so in that higher everything. six, seven, eight, twelve. That's somehow that kind of comes. Uh, the Earth play. doesn't go quite that high, okay. but the Earth is caught between the, the lower and the higher dimensions, doing its own cycle. We'll get into that later on. This whole class on that. So, yeah. uh, speaking of desire, uh, that's why the Buddha said um, a desire is the is the cause of all our problems. Mm. If we're suffering, we're absolutely. Absolutely. suffering, yeah. Of Which our, of could, be, right. could be hell, suffering. That's how I cannot, what I could understand between, like, because we are, for my understanding uh, of life and earth, if we are all, we are here in earth or hell all the time. Which I say, suffering, you can, you can live experience by suffering or, you know, when you meditate and you feel that peace and that, Mm -hmm. Self, you know, that creativity, that could be like... So we are constantly probably working to eliminate the ego because the ego is kind of weak in... Weak in, I don't know, weak? Mm -hmm. It makes us weak our true potential. Mm -hmm. And that's why it keeps us in this suffering which could be described as hell. Jealousy, anger, you know, like mm -hmm. killing people or you know, love, creation, which are different levels that we are constantly in. Yeah, we create our own suffering because we carry the seeds for our suffering within us. It's and it's a choice, which is, you can't forget that part. It's right. a choice. It's one for all, no, for one kind of thing. I still think that one essence is supposed to work with all the other essences. It's like it's a, well, they're all it's one and the same thing. They're all yeah. parts of the same whole. And that is, that's where Sometimes other things dictate what happens on the other side. It's not like a balance. It's out of balance sometimes. You know, we turn sand instead of ascending, we turn sand or yep. go down because yep. of other circumstances. Uh, what do you mean by other circumstances? Um, instead of ascending, um, I don't know how to put it, uh, instead of ascending in a certain f formula, mm -hmm. There's different formulas that change that can be manipulated. So we stay at this thing instead of ascending where we should be at a certain amount of time or a certain amount of 108. You know, you have 108, but some people might ascend at 50. Oh, but yeah, yeah, yeah. But, yeah but it doesn't have to be, yeah. There's things that's 
transcend that or ascend that, or I don't know how to put it. Yeah. But that's what I'm saying. It's, it's yeah, sometimes you technically, you technically need one. You only need one lifetime to awaken consciousness. Yeah. You don't need 108. Mm -hmm. You don't need two. You can do it in. This is something you do in a single lifetime. Everybody sitting in these chairs right now is able to do this in one lifetime. If they take the effort, if they put in, if they put the work for it, and that kind of stuff. Yeah, so absolutely. It's and not see, my feeling is from what I've learned or heard is that balance is out of whack kind of thing, I guess. Mm -hmm. you can but they'll get into the things. Yeah, anything like that. Uh, the instinctive forces of nature trap the innocent mind of man and the false mirage of desire arose. Because it's interesting to think about the ego, because the egos that we carry within are all, um, for lack of a better term, perversions of the instincts that we see in animal kingdoms. The instinct in animal kingdom to of hunger and thirst becomes perverse in humanity and becomes gluttony. The instinct in the animal kingdom of, you know, oh, big scary thing, come on, I better run away, becomes the various fears and phobias. The instinct in the animal kingdom to protect one's young and defend yourself becomes regression and that kind of behavior in the, animal, in the human kingdom. The instinct of, you know, procreating and breeding in the animal kingdom becomes lust and the various things associated with that in the human kingdom. So that's what we see is it's basically a, a, almost like a twist of these instinctive forces being manipulated by the ego. Yes? So if desire gave birth to the ego, mm -hmm. then what if um, our desire is to break free from the ego? Would that not just be another desire? You gotta be careful with that one. Because, yeah. Mm -hmm. Wrong yeah. You can, you can, and there's a lot of people that approach spirituality and awakening consciousness from the ego as well. So the ego will never experience it, and therefore they'll never succeed. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, but I, that you, you're right, so you have to try to really see the difference between ego and... The hardest thing to do in this path, especially for the, the point that you guys are at, and, and we'll be at for a little while, is to distinguish the difference between the essence and the ego manifesting in your thoughts, your actions, and your emotions. And that's why the very first thing we taught was, what was the first thing we taught? No, you sick of hearing? Self-observation. Yeah. Self-observation. Remember you're going to get sick of hearing me say that because it's the answer to every question. Next time I say, what's the question? You're going to go self-observation. Right? Because that's why, that's why we start with that one. That's why that's the most important technique you can learn to develop because that's how you distinguish between those two voices. You, learn, you have to learn to recognize when the devil's talking on the shoulder or when the angel's talking on the shoulder. It's, it's, it's true because, for example, the, the, the ego, right, it's always wants to attention right mm -hmm. so when you have your like oh you know what I am really like social person and I have so much friends and I am awesome but if you if you observe yourself it could be that the side of the ego not being alone because he can be by himself because he always needs the attention and he yeah. always is so so it's a good positive thing but behind all that could be yeah, and one of, the, and one of the mistakes to make too is, is we think of ego, we focus on negative things. We think of fear and anger and you know, um, um, lust that leads to infidelity and stuff like that. We focus on those, but as I mentioned earlier, we forget about pride. We forget about, believe it or not, this is a tough one to wrestle with, happiness is mm -hmm. an ego. Exactly. Because the happiness that you experience isn't a permanent, lasting state of happiness. It's a false happiness dependent upon external factors who you're with and whether you have money and how your job's going. It's not the same as like a permanent state of happiness and contentment and bliss and all that kind of stuff. But we forget to self-observe when we're having a good time. We forget to self-observe when things are going good. We forget to self-observe when we're with the right people. We just want to self-observe all these negative states. But we have to learn to identify in ourselves that yes, egos are responsible for the fear and the depression and the anger, but they're also responsible for the pride and the happiness and the social behavior and stuff as well that we think is positive. Yeah. What about happiness when it comes to this, the positive sensation we get when it comes to meditating? See, that's different. And if you have a, um, if you ever had a really good experience with meditation and managed to get yourself to that point, you recognize that this is something unique. This is different from happiness because I went to a good party or happiness because uh, you know we're good with my family or something like that. Then how do you consciously differentiate between the two? 
that's what we can do. Know myself. Know myself. Yeah. Yeah, it's true, and it, it, literally, it literally is an experience thing. It literally is learning because to differentiate. Because it's, it's one thing is hap to have happy thoughts, and one thing is to really experience it, like, yeah. like happy. And like, remember, too, in the world's religions, the devil is always the trickster, right? And he's the one that tricks you into not knowing what he's doing, and he's the one that tries to distract you and trick you, because that's what the ego is. And I think I'm in that point in my life <laughs> with I when, when I am to... Make, see the difference because, for example, through meditation, through walking nature, yep. through I don't know playing music or through I don't know hug a tree, the sensations, the feelings. When you realize something, you don't have to think anymore about it. You already feel it. If you try to think, oh, the sky is so beautiful and the sun in there, right? Mm -hmm. So then, as this takes away, from is you. that between you know? It's very. I don't get it, Steve Jet, but it, it's. And that's that's the idea behind self-observation is literally to lend you or lead you to that state where you can differentiate between the consciousness and the ego, and it's 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 a difficult thing to do, and it's not you know I mean I've been doing this now for 10, 11 years, and it's not it's not like night and day. <laughs> There's many times when I find myself under the influence of, of one that I didn't even know. And the same thing people that have been in this for 25, 30, 40 years. It's not like it's that cut and dry. That's where the practice comes in, is being able to learn to differentiate between those states. And once you can learn to differentiate between those states, and you know which one to trust and which one not to trust, and then you can know, you know, there's that fork in the road, you know which one to choose, like which one to not identify with. And that's what's really hard. Because remember, you are 97% ego. That means 97% of the time, everything you're thinking, feeling, and doing belongs to one ego or another. Yeah, now, these, there are these glimpses that we can get in various states, like you described. Meditation is a great one. Walk in nature can trigger one as well. Uh, various pieces of music, performance listening can trigger different states. We can trigger that superior emotional intellectual center, right? And we can experience something other than the ego. We've all saw some of us have been in perhaps a, a crisis situation where a little voice comes forth and says, this is what you need to do or something like that. We've all experienced that before. But 97% of the time, it's the ego driving the car. Mm -hmm. And we unfortunately are convinced that we're in control and that it's not the ego. We know when anger and stuff like that happens, we can say, well, I don't want that. That's got to be ego. But don't forget that most people aren't angry 97% of the time. Most people aren't jealous 97% of the time. So there's a whole a host of other things there as well. Yeah. On the note about um, if happiness coming from work on the self is an ego or not, I've heard it said that people people who are on the esoteric path don't usually congratulate themselves and from lifetime to lifetime that can become severe and crippling almost so it's not good to forget to praise yourself in a good way but not in an egotistical way yeah is it would that be yeah a safe i wouldn't say? say praise yourself i would say a different your own accomplishments. okay <laughs> yeah yeah okay. exactly and, and, and to be good. thankful just thankful to god thankful to the universe for the opportunity. for for all the good blessings that you have, mm -hmm. that's the law of, na of nature, uh, mm -hmm. what we call law of uh, attraction. Mm -hmm. The more thankful you are, the more blessings you get. You don't expect, you're not constantly hungering and lusting for more goodness, but you're just thankful what you have. And I find, personally mm -hmm. for me, I've been practicing the law of attraction, and I've been getting a lot of blessings just by being thankful each day, and being. Just being so grateful, having a positive and, attitude. Yeah, and remember the, the you know the true path to happiness is not even wanting to attract anything. It's being completely content with everything mm -hmm. you have and exactly. everything that's happening to you and exactly where you are. And that's a really hard thing to do because we want stuff. <laughs> that's yeah. right. And remember, yeah, you that. can you can you can approach esoteric studies wrongly as well because you can want mm -hmm. consciousness and you can want to ask rejection and you can want yeah. to remember your past yeah. lives and want 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 want. want. This is Knowing what? the desires and the needs. Desires yeah. and the needs. Yeah. Yeah. Does it make bizarre, uh, yeah. There's a difference between happiness and contentment. Mm -hmm. okay. Is sorrow an ego? Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Remember, uh, when ego comes back, it's satisfying those desires. It's satisfying. It wants that food. It wants to sustain itself on that energy. And we just keep feeding it from existence to existence. Um, so speaking of that revolution, the evolutionary process does not naturally go to self-realization. It ties into the quote at the beginning of the class. Self-realization is not an automatic mechanical process. So sitting around all day, it's not like 108 lives, 
snap your fingers, oh, now you continue on to the next level. Okay, it's something that requires an act of change. We must start a revolution against the wheel of samsara. We have to start fighting those forces. And the revolution is the path of the revolution of the consciousness. That's what we're having to do, right? Uh, you'll see if uh, you've got the link for the website already. Um, if you don't, you will have, if I've got your name on my little piece of paper, you'll see that in addition to the PowerPoint classes, there's two uh, PDF books up there as well. And one of them is called Revolutionary Psychology. And that's all about the path to, you know, and also tapes and know thyself, fighting against uh, the ego and leading towards self-realization. <coughs> if we escape the wheel of samsara, then we become masters, buddhas, angels. That's what that is. To look at people like, you know, the Buddha, look at people like Krishna, look at people like Jesus. That's what those individuals did. That's why they were different from the rest of humanity. And remember that Jesus, you know, dying and resurrecting, that's what he was trying to show. You know, the, the ego is dead. The spiritual side of me has been reborn. And what happened? He ascended. He went up, right? That was all an allegory for the process that we're talking about, that revolution. Okay, I mean, Jesus was, you know, it was all part of his, his master plan to kind of lay that out for humanity. We'll talk a little bit about that at a much later date. But the idea of death and resurrection is unique to Christianity or Jesus, right? It's that, that whole process. Any more questions? That was a lot of questions. What time is it? Very interesting. I've been talking for a long time. <laughs>